You're listening to the Nightlight Radio Network. This is Dr. Zohara Hieronymus, co-host of 21st Century Radio. We are happy to present this rebroadcast of our show on Nightlight. Enjoy. In 1984, Michael Cremo began a lifelong journey researching the Hindu Puranic accounts of human origins and antiquity. This research has taken him around the world into archaeology, other academic and scientific conferences, always being the one to upset the status quo with those problematic things called anomalous evidence relating to human antiquity. We did not evolve from apes, Cremo's work shows over and over. We are not the result of long evolutionary progression from less to more developed beings. In fact, we have devolved from highly spiritual beings to humans covered over in greater densities of flesh and cultures. His work, like others before him, whose names have been hidden from the scientific academies in the world, found evidence, as the Bible and the Vedas and other traditions state, that humanity began with the creation of the world. I encourage all of you to join us for the next hour and a half as Michael Cremo shares with us, as he does audiences worldwide, his latest book, a collection of his 24 papers presented between 1994 and 2009 in a release called My Science, My Religion. Michael, it is always a pleasure to spend some time with you. Good to be with you, Sahara, and all your listeners. I had the best time reading this book. I read it over a period of hours, over a period of a few days, because there's so much in it. So I, I think for the benefit of those who have not seen you on the numerous television shows that you're on or been to any of your presentations, wherever it is in the world you travel, give us a little bit of your history about what happened to you in 1984. Well, actually, I think we have to go back even further than that, Zohara. Uh, when I was growing up, I lived in a lot of different countries. You know, my father was an intelligence officer in the United States Air Force, so that had an influence on me when I was growing up. You know, when I was about 16 years old, I was living in Wiesbaden, Germany. My father was stationed there, and I was going to an American high school in Germany. And during my vacations, I would go to different places in Europe. So on one of my vacations, a friend of mine and I went up to Stockholm, Sweden. I was staying in a youth hostel there, and I met some European kids who had traveled overland to India. You were able to do that in those days. It's not so easy to do it today. Uh, and you know, they told me just really fascinating stories about their experiences there in the Himalayan mountains and seeing the Ganges River and meeting different kinds of yogis and spiritually inclined people. So I became fascinated with the spiritual culture of India. And as I was uh, growing up, I, you know, of course, I had to adopt a worldview or make a worldview, some way of making sense of myself and the world that I live in. So I, I found the, the spiritual tradition of ancient India to be very helpful. And I eventually became a disciple of a guru from India. Now, I'm not you know, claiming to have a monopoly on spiritual truth. I think you can find truth in a lot of the different ancient wisdom traditions, whether we're tell, talking about uh, Christianity or Judaism or Islam or Buddhism or uh, many of the other great spiritual wisdom traditions of the world. I think there's truth to be found in all genuine spiritual traditions. So I'm not claiming monopoly on truth, but it, I, I, I'm just explaining what I found helpful uh, for me in my own journey through life. And and so, certainly the the Vedic tradition was stands a little differently in terms of both what it believes, what it teaches, and what it honors than the Western tradition you likely grew up in. So that in itself already sets you apart from many Westerners. Yes, uh, I I think it it did. I've I've always been a bit of an individualist, so. Um, that shows. <laughs> Clearly shows your reputation walks before you now worldwide. I loved, by the way, I just had to say this, that in one of the uh, 
things about your new book, My Science, My Religion, quote, promises to escalate Cremo's intellectually dissident profile onto a new level of controversy. There you go. You're at it once more. All right. So you, you had this deep devotion and a desire to study the Vedic tradition. And certainly it's, it's telling of our time and our purpose on earth is very different from the European sort of Darwinian Western almost mythology that we've all been grown, grown up with. Yeah, I mean, as I got deeply involved in studying the ancient Sanskrit writings, I learned, especially from the Puranas, those are the historical writings of ancient India, I learned that they were presenting an idea of human history quite different from anything that I learned from my teachers in high school or university. Uh, they were talking about human populations that existed millions of years ago, going all the way back to the very beginnings of the history of life on Earth. Whereas in the Western education system, I'd been learning that humans like us first appeared between 100 and 200,000 years ago, having evolved from more primitive ape-like human ancestors. So this idea that humans like us have always been present on Earth, have been here for vast periods of time was something quite different. And I had to think, well, how am I going how how am I going to put that into my worldview? I could look at it as just mythology, but I decided to just check and see is there any physical archaeological evidence that would support this idea of extreme human antiquity. Of course you, you won't find any such evidence in the current textbooks, but I decided to look beyond the textbooks, look into the original scientific reports published by archaeologists and geologists and other scientists who were digging into the earth. And when I did that, and I looked not just in the English language reports, you know, because of the way I was brought up, you know, I have a reading knowledge of a lot of different languages. So when I looked into the original scientific reports from the time of Darwin up to the present, I found many reports of archaeologists and other Earth scientists finding human bones, human artifacts, human footprints, millions of years old. So I collected them in a book, you know, Forbidden Archaeology, I started that research in 1984. That's that's where the 1984. I see, and date it's such. I mean, in. the the book is so well known in 20 plus some languages around the world. Forbidden archaeology, and certainly it was a bestseller in '93, and and it's then again with Richard Thompson, who you co-authored it. Well, with it's it's a, it's a continuing bestseller in the yeah. archaeology category. It's usually in the top 10 archaeology bestsellers on Amazon. It's wonderful. Uh, for, so it's uh, it's uh, it, there's there there seems to be uh, a group of people out there a certain segment of the population that's interested in well, hearing you know, alternative ideas about human origins. Well, the, the beauty of the, of your work, and I remember when you and I spoke about another book of yours as well, Human Devolution, is like your father as an intelligence officer. You don't just put out a theory. You you have assembled such an amazing. Um, a massive body of proofs and of other peoples that have looked at the kind of evidence you found. And, and I think that what you have so compellingly proved is that we have a knowledge filtering that goes on in our society. So we basically live with an artificial system of understanding. Talk to us a little bit about that, the knowledge filter. Well, you know, when I started doing my research in the history of archaeology and started encountering all of these scientific reports of human bones, human artifacts, human footprints, many millions of years old, you know, I, I had to ask myself a question. If these reports are there in the sci scientific literature, the, what, what I call the primary scientific literature, uh, I divide the scientific literature into two parts the primary scientific literature, original reports by original investigators, and the secondary literature, by which I mean textbooks and things like that, that are based on 
or supposedly based on the primary literature. I, I have to ask myself a question. If all these reports of extreme human antiquity are there in the primary scientific literature, why aren't they in the textbooks? So that's what got me thinking about this process of what I came to call knowledge filtration. Uh, whereby reports of evidence that conform to a dominant theory will pass through this intellectual filter and make their way into textbooks and public presentations by scientists. And if you've got, on the other hand, if you have reports of evidence that radically contradict a dominant theory, they tend to be filtered out set aside, forgotten, dismissed, in some cases actively suppressed. And I found that this process of knowledge filtration operates not only in archaeology, but in other areas of science as well. You were mentioning my book, Human Devolution. I mean, after people read my book, Forbidden Archaeology, they asked, well, if we didn't evolve from the apes, where did we come from? So to answer that question, I wrote this other book, Human Devolution. And in it, I propose, well, before we even ask the question, where did human beings come from, we should first of all ask the question, what is a human being? Today, many scientists will say, we're just machines made of matter. We're machines made of molecules. That's what we are. But I propose, no, we're really uh, something more than that. We are conscious selves who originally existed on a level of pure consciousness. Matter didn't produce consciousness, but consciousness can come in contact with matter and become covered by it. So in that book, I presented lots of evidence, scientific evidence, showing that there is a conscious self that can exist apart from the brain, apart from the body, and this comes from medical investigations of out-of-body experiences, psychiatric studies of past life memories, and things of, of that sort, which is also affected by this knowledge filtration process, although there have been many detailed scientific studies on these topics, you won't see them in the mainstream textbooks of psychology or biology and things of that sort. So I think this knowledge filtering process operates in a lot of different areas of science, and the effect of it is we're not getting a complete picture of ourselves and the universe. We're getting just a partial picture. And when you look at the full picture, you see that our scientific picture of reality should include a lot of things now that are considered to be uh, outside the bounds of science, that are just supposedly matters of religious or spiritual belief. A, a real scientific picture of reality, I think, involves merging many things that people now put in the separate categories of science and religion. Well, you know, and I think that's one of the beautiful... Um ways in which you've approached your work in the world, which is that consciousness, and we certainly know, and on 21st Century Radio, this is something we've sort of specialized in profiling that is outside the limits of time and space. And, and because you had this sort of broad perspective that we are souls that take on bodies, that when you encounter this um, paradigm of gross materialism, all of us, even as young children, know something's missing. And so when you take this um, unit of consciousness, this awareness you have, into the field you went into, which was sort of just looking at the dustbin of history, when you can look at things and say, as you do in one of your chapters, one of the papers you delivered, of the body as temple and the temple as body, there's a much greater um, appreciation that archaeology is not just dead stuff. It's, it's a remembering of something that we're still part of. Talk to us a little bit about that, if you would, of, of your own sort of, um, I would have to say, a love affair with archaeology as part of consciousness. 
You bring up an important point, uh, Zohar. You know, many people think of archaeology as simply dealing with stones and, and bones. I think ultimately what it's dealing with is questions that lead to what we really are. Who are we really? In other words, why do archaeologists engage in archaeology at all? I think it's, it's, it has to, it can't just be a fascination with dead remains, a fascination with death, uh, because you, know, you're, you may be you know, digging up some bones. But uh, I remember one archaeologist from Europe uh, once told me, you know, she was just wondering, well, what would it be like to dig up the remains of your own body from a past life. In other words, you get into things that lead to contemplation of the real nature of the self, uh, the self that can exist apart from these physical aspects of it, the non-material aspects of, of the, the self, uh, that there are connections of archaeology with the paranormal. And actually, earlier this year, in January, I was at a meeting of the World Archaeological Congress. It's one of the world's largest international organizations of archaeologists. It meets every four years in a different country. So uh, this most recent meeting was held on the Dead Sea in Jordan. And I was presenting a paper there, and it was a paper about how a prominent scientist had used a psychic in his archaeological research. Uh, this was uh, Dr. J.T. Robinson, who was conducting excavations at the Sterkfontein Caves in South Africa in the 1960s. He's mentioned in all the textbooks. He discovered fossils of Australopithecus, a type of ape man who existed millions of years ago. That's in all the textbooks, but what's not mentioned is he, he brought a psychic into the Sterkfontein Caves, and the psychic lay down in the caves, went into a psychic trance, and Dr. Robinson would put little fossils of Australopithecus on his forehead, and the psychic was able to envision what the creature actually looked like in its real biological form and what it was doing, you know, millions of, of years ago. So... You know, many people, you know, because of this process of knowledge filtration, would be completely unaware of this, you know, that this prominent scientist was making use of these psychic techniques to understand the past. When I presented this paper at the World Archaeological Congress meeting in Jordan a few weeks ago, uh, some of the archaeologists who were listening came up to me afterwards and said, I... I had, I didn't know about this, and I said, well, that's my business to tell you things you don't already know, because a lot of science basically has to do with just repeating mm -hmm. in different ways what's already known. Mm -hmm. and, and, and oftentimes erroneous. And, you know, it's interesting because I remember when I interviewed Stefan Schwartz years ago in the Alexandria Project where they used... Um, psychics, I think her name was Helen Hamdi at the time, and others to discover the ancient port of Alexandria and things related to Cleopatra. But, you know, you talk about it later. We do have to take a break, but you talk about it later because we know from First Peoples traditions in many great societies around the planet that in folk archaeology, shamans and other great dreamers, and certainly the Greeks did this, were able to come into resource of information for anything they put their attention to. So when we come back, I want to talk a little bit about your own use of meditation as a researcher.
When I think of the many conversations I have had with Bill Tiller, who was the chairman of material sciences at Stanford, I believe it was, and all the work he did in meditation and then the very real sort of work in trying to figure out how you turn on an environment by sort of incubating a space and how practice meditators have this capacity to bring down from the immaterial into the material at great distances. And I know that you have been a lifelong meditator, and you talk about it in your most recent book, My Science, My Religion. Share with us a little bit about meditation and its um, role in your life, both as a scientist and as an individual. Well, I became interested in these things as a, as a young man, and I uh, took initiation from a guru from India, uh, his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. And from him I learned uh, a type of meditation, Hare Krishna mantra meditation. But uh, I think there are a lot of different ways to approach this. I'm not claiming to have a monopoly. I'm just sharing, you know, in response to your question, what my personal personal practice has been. And every day I spend about two hours meditating in this way. And what I find it does is it centers me in my real identity so that I'm able to exist in this world, be in it, but not of it, you know, where I maintain a connection with the world around me, but also a connection with my higher self, that self of pure consciousness that comes ultimately from another dimension of reality. If I didn't do that, I think I would lose my connection with that higher self and the goals and the values that support it. And I would become more completely involved in just the the day-to-day activities of producing and consuming material things, which is what our present human civilization is geared to. Uh, You turn on practically any type of media, you're kind of bombarded with some very materialistic messages. So I'm happy there's shows like yours that are presenting, uh, trying to present a more balanced picture of what we really are. But I find that personal practice, that daily practice of mantra meditation centers my consciousness it puts me in touch with the higher realities and then what i i regard what i'm doing as part of my spiritual practice it's part of my yoga it's part of my meditation the scientific research that i'm doing the presentations that i make in at scientific conferences, the lectures that I give at universities, the interviews that I give on radio stations, I regard that all as part, ultimately, of my yoga, my meditation. It's beneficial for me, and I hope it's beneficial for others. Well, no doubt it has been. You know, it's so interesting. So I want to come back to this this use of our phenomenal capacities that we have of being beings of consciousness. And you've done a lot of study in the mind and consciousness, sort of this frontier of humanity. In your 18th paper in your book, Michael, you talk about folk archaeology, the use of dreams and visions as really a, a traditional part of how people who are still part of the Vedic tradition and others worldwide go about sort of reconnecting to the past and making it potent in the present. Uh, yes, Zohara. I, I became interested in that. Of course, I, you know, I, I was looking into archaeology, and one of the questions that comes up is the history of archaeology in you know, different countries. Uh, you know, for example, if you look at the history of archaeology in India, mostly the textbooks say it began when the Europeans came and started looking at the ancient ruins and digging into the ground you know, in the 17th century and 18th century. But uh, when I looked into it, I could see that there was a parallel indigenous tradition of archaeology that was somewhat different from, you know, the 
European or Western type of archaeology, at least the, the way it's presented in the textbooks. And this parallel archaeological tradition that's been there for thousands of years in India involves uh, for example, different saints and mystics, say, having a dream or a vision that some lost sacred image is present somewhere, and then they go and they dig it and they excavate it and they find it. That's what got me looking into the history of Western archaeology, because many people will think, okay, maybe some ancient people, you know, Australian aboriginals or North American tribal peoples or people in India would be engaging in this sort of extrasensory kind of archaeology or paranormal or psychic archaeology. But I found that even in the history of Western archaeology, you could find such things. A little bit earlier on the show, I was mentioning the case of uh, J.T. Robinson, a prominent scientist who had brought a psychic to assist with his archaeological research at, in the Sterkfontein Caves in South Africa. And you were mentioning, Sahara, Stefan Schwartz, who is also involved in this psychic archaeology and you know, I, I had an interesting meeting with him a few years ago. We were both speaking at a conference in Montreal, and he was uh, speaking about remote viewing mm -hmm. because this is the psychic technique that some of, that he and some of his colleagues have applied in archaeology, as, as you were mentioning, to locate things uh, near Alexandria, the waters off Alexandria, Egypt. Uh, they were able to do that. So he was having a, a workshop on remote viewing, which you know he claims is an ability that we all have to some extent or another. And uh, yeah, there were about 100 of, of us in this workshop, and it was about remote viewing. And what he did was he selected three people from among us, said, get in the car, get in a taxi, go anywhere you want in the whole city within a 15 mile radius, and then uh, when you get to that place, try to send the imagery from your minds back to our minds here at the hotel where the conference was being held. So those three people, they got in the car, they drove off. He'd also give them a, uh, gave them a video uh, camera to record the location that they would choose. So... They got in the car and they drove off. Fifteen minutes later, uh, we did an exercise. And uh, Stephen Schwartz had asked us to just clear our minds, and then whatever imagery came into our minds, we were to write down. And he said, as you did, Zahar, don't try to judge it, don't try to interpret it, just put it down. So the first image that came into my mind was, candle flames and red glass holders and my mind was resisting it like anything because I, I was convinced somehow that these people had gone to a bowling alley and, <laughs> you know, I, you know, but I thought okay let me just play along with this uh, you know, so I wrote down the image and then we were kind of asked what do we see when we look up when we look forward when we look back to the right to the left when we look down just write it all down so, uh, you know, I did all that. And uh, actually, there was another researcher who was there as well, Rupert Sheldrake, uh, who was there doing this exercise with me. But in any case, after some time... The that sounds like back. some fraternity of people. <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah, it was. It was really a fantastic meeting. And uh, the three people came back. They took the videotape out of the camera put it into a, a playback uh, machine, and the first image that came on the screen was candle flames and red glass holders. I, mm -hmm. mean, I was just shocked. Mm -hmm. I mean, I believe in these things. I accept them. But even for me, it was uh, a bit of a uh, an awakening to see that this was an ability that I actually had mm -hmm. as well. You know, so it's it's this remote viewing ability that... Stephen Schwartz and others have 
applied in what they call you know psychic archaeology and uh, what I've found fascinating is that there are similar sorts of things to be found in different ancient wisdom traditions and I've kind of concentrated on on this kind of extrasensory archaeology that's manifested in the history of India and I've presented a few papers on this topic at major international conferences in archaeology, and they've been very well accepted. And uh, one of the papers I presented on this extrasensory archaeology, I, the paper was called Excavating the Eternal. And it was uh, I presented it at a meeting of the World Archaeological Congress, and it was later published in Antiquity, which is one of the mainstream journals of archaeology, scientific journals of archaeology. So it's one of the papers that's included in this latest book of mine, My Science, My My Religion. And I think the significance of that is, is you know, some people might think, okay, psychic archaeology, stuff like that. Well, that's that's outside mainstream completely but I, I think it's interesting I have been able to present papers on topics like that at mainstream scientific conferences on archaeology and get them published in peer-reviewed scientific publications you know when I think about the 30 years in which I've been doing interview work on the field of consciousness in particular and quantum physics which has sort of paralleled it it doesn't seem that there's really any question anymore that we are consciousness and that consciousness links everything that exists and everything that's non-existent as well. So that when we focus our attention on something, we even know in science from the observer effect, what we observe is changed by it, which is why you can't measure the speed or the distance at the same time, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, they call it. But so that when we then think about ourselves as being reincarnating beings, units of consciousness that take on bodies at different times, I loved that um, comment you mentioned earlier of an archaeologist saying, what if I dug up myself as a pa in a past life? So when, when then the world drops this Darwinian theory that we have evolved from primitive ape to the beings that we are today, how has that really kept us and kept archaeologists in particular from looking at what they find? How has it impacted the actual way in which an archaeologist has to go about interpreting what they see? Well, they have, I mean, we find it happening again and again and again. Uh, because of the particular theories that are now dominant in the scientific world, archaeologists think humans like us first came into existence fairly recently, within the past 100 or 200,000 years. So then what happens is when an archaeologist or other scientist encounters actual physical evidence showing that humans, like us were existing millions of years ago, the, the tendency will be think, well, that can't possibly be true. And you know, I've been able to document cases like that from the earlier history of archaeology right up to the more recent history of archaeology. You know, going back to the 19th century, there's the case of the California gold mine discoveries. You know, miners went out to California. They were digging tunnels into the Sierra Nevada mountains to get the gold. And inside those tunnels, they were finding human bones and human artifacts, obsidian spear points, stone mortars and pestles, things like that, in layers of rock that modern geologists tell us are about 50 million years old. So these discoveries were reported to the scientific world by Dr. J.D. Whitney, who was a professional geologist, the chief government geologist of California. His report was published by Harvard University. But we don't see these things in the textbooks today because of this process of knowledge filtration. There was a contemporary of uh, this 
scientist. His name was William Holmes. He worked at the Smithsonian Institution. He was an anthropologist there. And he said, if Dr. Whitney had understood the theory of human evolution, he wouldn't have announced those discoveries. He wouldn't have published that report. In other words, if the facts didn't support the dominant theory, then they had to be explained away, forgot, put aside. And that's that's what happened. So that is how these ideas can influence how archaeologists relate to the evidence that comes to their attention. And therefore, what we wind up with is an incomplete set of facts upon which to base our generalizations about human origins and antiquity. So I think it has a big effect, and the effect of it has been to give support to very materialistic ideas about who we are and where we came from. You know, if we think we're just evolved apes, if we think we're just machines made of matter, in the, in the words of Richard Daw- Dawkins, a prominent evolutionist, we're, we're survival machines, we're robot vehicles uh, meant to preserve the uh, selfish molecules known as genes. If that's all that we really are, machines made of molecules in competition with each other for survival, what what kind of effect does that have on our worldwide human civilization? You know, because you know, the goals that we set for ourselves are to a large extent determined by our sense of identity. You know, if I think I'm an American man, well, that's how I set my goals, my values, my ambitions. If we think we're just machines made of molecules in competition with each other for survival, then I think that's going to influence our goals, our values. I think these are some of the underlying causes of our world's environmental crisis, the intense levels of conflict that we see in the world today, our financial crisis. I think these all have their roots in this basic concept of self that is being given to us by modern science today. Yeah, I think that's beautifully stated. We're going to take our last break of the hour, and when we come back, maybe we can pick up on this theme, because I loved your chapter on divine nature, which shows us how this synthesis of science and religion, and in this case through the Vedic teachings, and you do a beautiful job of describing it, offers us answers to this environmental crisis we all share a part in. You can learn more about Michael Cremo's work, attend his lectures, go around the world with him at www.mcremo.com. I, by the way, I love your your diary notes, your journal travel notes, Michael. They're they're personal. They're not extravagant. They're to the point, and, and I find them very useful. So anyway, I mentioned before the break that I really enjoyed your chapter on divine nature which shows how a synthesis of science and religion, the the personal and the transpersonal, the material and the immaterial, come together. And you say that within the Vedic teachings, there are answers to our environmental crisis. Anyone who's really deeply studied the environmental crisis will understand that ultimately it's a spiritual problem that needs a spiritual solution. And... The reason I say that is because practically every aspect of our environmental crisis can be traced to our tendency in today's worldwide human civilization to overproduce and overconsume material things. We're consuming the Earth's resources at an unsustainable rate, and in that process of overproduction and overconsumption of material things were poisoning the air, poisoning the land, poisoning the water chemically and sometimes with radioactive substances. So it's it's a it's a huge problem and there's a lot of attention being given to how to clean things up. But to really get to the root of it, how do we get to the root of it? This process of overconsumption and overproduction. Uh, It was Gandhi who once said that 
the world has enough for everyone's need, but not enough for everyone's greed. So I think it's this overly materialistic concept of the self that is, to a large extent, responsible for our present tendency to overproduce and overconsume. Uh, modern science, as I was mentioning a little bit earlier on the show, is telling us we're just machines made of matter in competition with each other for survival. So to me, it's no surprise that the values and goals of most people in the world have become overly materialistic so that they think that to produce and consume more and more material things is the main purpose of human existence and our whole financial system, our whole economic system is designed to encourage that. So it's <clears throat> how to get to the root of it. I think we need a new concept of self something to replace this idea that we're just machines made of matter in competition with each other for survival. And what the great wisdom traditions of the world have offered to us is the vision that we're beings of pure consciousness, we're, uh, who have somehow or other come in contact with the world of matter. And the main purpose of human life should not be the production and consumption of more and more material things. It should be how to free consciousness from its contact with matter and return consciousness to its original pure state. Now, that doesn't mean giving up all material things, but it means putting things in proper balance. If we had the concept that if the world scientists and our education system, we're giving us the idea that we're beings of pure consciousness who are meant to return consciousness to its original pure state, we would try to satisfy our material needs in the most simple, natural, and efficient way possible. And we would also find ways of experiencing happiness from within, not from the consumption of more and more material things. We would find a way to enjoy happiness from within. And I think there are different techniques of meditation, yoga, contemplation that can help us do that. And the effect of that, I think, would be a bringing of our level of material production and consumption down to a sustainable level, and I think that would greatly reduce the pressures on the environment. I think that's the direction that we have to go if we're going to have a real solution to the world's environmental crisis. We need to expand the number of people who are willing to live lives voluntarily that are more simple and natural. I don't think it's something that can be imposed on people by government policies, no matter how well intended. It has to be something that comes from within, voluntarily. I think that's beautifully put. And, and as you say, the purpose of human life is the cultivation of consciousness. We can attain non-material satisfaction. So I think you've just done a, a beautiful job, Michael, of, of allowing other people to open their hearts and their minds to some part of themselves that maybe our culture has tried to, to veil, cloak, or even just bury. Yeah, I, I, I think it's important, I think, not to make exclusive claims to truth either, because that, that can also be, you know, cause a lot of problems, as we see in the world. But what I'm talking about is techniques, which are there in many different traditions that will help restore consciousness to its original pure state, just like a, a geologist could tell us how to extract the element gold from its ore, where it's mixed with other less valuable things. So once you've extracted the gold, you could form it into coins, and you could stamp the coins with the symbols of different nations. But if it's really gold, it doesn't matter what symbol that you 
stamped on it. Uh, so if by some technique of meditation or contemplation or yoga, one can rise to the understanding that I'm a being of pure consciousness, all others are beings of pure consciousness, we're all related to each other, there's no use in dividing ourselves into so many different conflicting groups on the basis of superficial kinds of identity, then if you've come to that level of awareness, then I think it doesn't matter what label you give it. You could call it Hinduism or Christianity or Judaism or whatever. It, 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 Islam, it doesn't make any difference what you call it, just as long as you've actually come to that level of awareness. Amen to all of that. Well, I want to encourage our audience to read your beautiful collection of your academic papers, My Science, My Religion, Academic Papers, 1994 to 2009. It's a Torchlight Publishing release, a 2012 publication, and you can learn more by going to Michael Cremo's website at www.mcremo.com. That's www.mcremo.com. And, Michael, thank you so much for being with 21st Century Radio this evening. Thank you very much, Sahara. You're welcome. 21st Century Radio is produced by Hieronymus and Company. Our executive producer and research assistant is Laura Kortner. Our engineer is Noah Dankner. I'm Dr. Zohar Hieronymus, and we hope you enjoyed the show.